All right, so good morning. So my, my daughter's in film school, so I always know now that I have to wait for the cameraman before I can start. I can't start before the cameraman's ready. Very good, okay. So, uh, my name is Jim Newland, and I am the uh, president. I'm honored to be the president of the La Mesa Historical Society. Uh, I also do a few other things around La Mesa. Uh, I think I'm on the Planning Commission and the Historic Preservation Commission, some other things. But anyway, um, as well as um, I work for state parks, I'm a manager, uh, historian, and planner work on projects all over all over the state. And so it's great when I, now that I'm a manager guy, I don't get to do as much history as when I was the regional historian, but uh, it's always good to get back. And uh, the local history stuff is really what has always driven me. Um, from the time I moved down here in 1985 uh, from San Jose to go to San Diego State, go Aztecs, um, and get my two degrees out of San Diego State to become a professional historian, public historian, uh, it, it, it's just sort of got involved in sort of the local level because I think a lot of times people maybe you might be intrigued by you know national international history ancient history modern history whatever it is um, but something that can be relevant to you is certainly what's the history of your city your neighborhood your house um, your street the building down the street whatever and so I'm very involved in on that and uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the things we're doing at the society for that so we appreciate all of you uh, especially our members if you're not a member it's easy to sign up you can do it online uh, and then you'll know exactly all the fun things that are going on with us the other way is to become when you become a member is of course then our newsletter and we have just made the big switch here and we're going to emailed newsletters so um, but certainly, um, if you need a hard copy, please just let us know. Cheryl, our membership uh, chair, is up. Uh, you probably passed her and said hello to her on the way in today. Uh, let us know if we, you do need a hard copy, and we will get you one. Um, but this is the newsletter. This is to find out what's going on, and we always have lots of interesting things going on. Um, and Like our roundtable lectures like this, we do about three or four. We may actually do a few more this year just because of some things that are going on, uh, some special things uh, that we're partnering with. Um, and, and it's just part of what we do. We also do our big home tour every year. Uh, and we are sort of hinting that we might be headed back toward the hills of Grossmont and Helix this year. Uh, last year we did Eastridge. If you didn't see that, it was an amazing mixture of, of mid-century modern and craftsman gems. Um, the year before that, we were in the Highlands. The year before that, we were at Mount Helix. Again, the area did all mid-century modern. Uh, so we were looking for, we think we have a pretty good mix headed. Looks like we're headed out here. We'll see See how that works out always. We've got to get the first two, and then we build around it, sort of how it works. And that's always the first Saturday in November. I think it's the second this year, November 2nd. So make sure you have that on you and save the date, because it's always a great event. It's our big fundraiser for the society. Um, so what other exciting things going on? Um, uh, well, and speaking of our love, and uh, look, we've had comments. We were very lucky. Um, for the last year, we've had a very talented lady by the name of Christina De Plata who helped us redesign our newsletter. Uh, she, unfortunately, her, she's so busy that she's not going to be able to continue to help us out with that. So we are looking for a new editor. If you know anything about InDesign, the program InDesign, the template's there. We just need someone to help us put it together. Uh, we do four a year. So we are looking for that. Um, thanks, Christina, for all her work in, in getting us into the modern view, as we say. Uh, for our newsletter. Um, so that's what's going on. Our next lecture, interestingly enough, will be actually more of a workshop on April 20th. We'll be back here. Uh, we, are, we are partnering uh, with the, the Historic Society. One of our missions is to promote historic preservation. So we're working with the city of La Mesa on the update of our historical survey. We had a wonderful historical survey, a sur survey done back in the early 80s. It hasn't, unfortunately, been updated much. And so there's been a few things that have slipped through. So we're in the process of helping the city, and we're partnering with San Diego State's History and Anthropology Departments uh, and we are going to actually be testing out an app tomorrow with some students to see if uh, how we can actually use our phones to record buildings and speed up the survey and perhaps knock out the whole city in record time to make sure that we understand what properties might have the potential to be historic properties and let folks know and promote the benefits of that and also help you if they're not so that if you go for permits that that can be all taken care of and uh, we can move forward and the city can move forward. So some some more on that on the 20th. Uh, you'll be hearing some more about that myself. I'll be, I'll be talking a little bit about the survey. We also have uh, Nikki Krebish who's an expert in historical property appraisals and the values of the benefits of having properties listed on, on historic registers and historic preservation to your property values, as well as some folks who have their houses listed and tell you about life living inside a historic house or operating or managing, maintaining one. So that's coming up uh, in next month. Uh, of course, always the, it takes more than it, just me standing up here and, and yabbering at you for an hour uh, to put these on. So I want to thank Steve Churchill, our communications uh, chair, for getting the word out. So many of you, uh, and letting me know how you found out how, about to come. Um, as well as Cheryl and Steve and Mark up, up top there helping us out, and we'll be able to sell books 
And afterwards, if it happens to be one of mine, I'll sign it. If it's not mine, I'll still sign it if you want. But, um, but it probably won't have the same effect. But anyway, so on that. Uh, and of course, part of that reach out is all of our partner organizations, nonprofit organizations. Uh, we really appreciate Mission Hills Heritage for promoting this as well. They have lots of exciting events going on in their, their very preservation-focused group up there. Uh, the city of La Mesa, of course, helped us out as well as postings on Nextdoor and other places to help get the word out. Our partners at the Mount Helix Park Foundation, which is very important to this book, um, as well as the Grossmont Mount Helix Improvement Association. We thank all those folks for helping us out. So with all the business out of the way, uh, I guess I was asked to come and talk a little bit about Mount Helix. Now, this is some, somewhat of an encore uh, presentation. So the, the origins, I had written the, this, the La Mesa book uh, for the city centennial that uh, was in 2012. Uh, the book came out in 2011. And then um, a, a young lady by the name of Tracy Stotts, who at the time was the executive director of the Mount Helix Park Foundation, cornered me another Aztec, and we, uh, and we started chatting, and she was, of course, trying to convince me to get on their board. <laughs> She's now our vice president. <laughs> yes, <laughs> sneaky I am. Uh, and is a great asset to us. Um, anyway, about, hey, you know, they're coming up on the 90th anniversary of the, the theater. Uh, a lot of people don't understand what's going on with the Park Foundation, how this all happened, and how unique it is in, in the history of planning. And as a park, state park planner and all, it, what's going on at Mount Helix and the park there is very unique, and I'll talk about that a little bit. A uh, very unique situation there, um, to just be able to sort of tell that story. And so they basically commissioned me to do this book. And, um, and so, interesting enough, when this book came out about three and a half years ago, uh, almost all the events I did were for them, of course, because they were the sponsor. It wasn't the Historical Society's book. So Stephen was realizing after uh, Spring Valley Historical Society asked me to re redo this talk for them a, a few months back, that I hadn't done it for the Historical Society. I hadn't talked about our, our neighboring La Mesa area. And we like to say, you know, that we cover the greater La Mesa area uh, with the Mesa Historical Society in our archives and our programming. So that means that Grossmont, Mount Helix, Calavo Gardens, Casa de Oro, Spring Valley are all sort of part of our historical realm, Fletcher Hills, as well as the western, I mean, the east, well, it's the eastern parts of San Diego, well, western part to us of San Carlos, Del Cerro, the college area, and all the neighborhoods there, Rolando, where, where I used to live. Um, is actually a part of the area that we cover. In fact, next Sunday, we will have a booth at the Rolando Street Fair covering not only the college area, but our history and getting people engaged, that we all have a common history when you actually get down to, to this and really look at it closely. So that's sort of what came out. So so here we go. So I, would, so I don't know how some of you might live in Mount Helix or, or in that or in Grossmont or whatever. We're going to talk about that a little bit, and that's what the book covers. It focuses more on that. It is mentioned a little bit in the La Mesa book, but this was really to focus on all those neighborhoods that are sort of under the influence around Mount Helix, which is why they bought off on that title for the book. So, okay, let's talk about that name. Now, it is a true story, and there was, of course, a couple different versions depending on what books you read in the past. Obviously, if you look at a cylindrical sort of uh, moving hillside uh, peak, oh, Helix, right? Helix is core thing, right? That all makes sense. But in fact, the story goes back to some pretty interesting characters. Uh, the first on the left there is probably one of the most noted pioneering natural scientists. When I say natural scientists, I mean like biologists. And today we hire in state parks and you know place biologists and botanists to do stuff. He was one of those first to try to go out and really uh, help document the flora and fauna across the U.S. He actually was from Switzerland. His name Louis Agassiz, or Agassiz, depending on how you pronounce it. Um, <clears throat> and he actually came from back east. He was at Harvard, uh, and he was invited to come out in the late uh, 1860s, early 1870s, and he made several trips here along with other famous people, a guy named Whitney, they named a little mountain for him, you ever heard of Josiah Whitney, um, who was out here at a brand new place called the University of California, open 1868, um, uh, who was doing some, some lecturing here on California and surveying a little place called Yosemite Valley and some other things that they were doing at the time. It was brand new stuff. And he happened to come into San Diego County looking to see what was going on down here in this sort of semi-arid climate and was surprised to find as he was, he went down to Spring Valley, as you'll see, was one of the early East County sort of pioneering community areas, uh, and happened to meet the guy who was sort of the leader of the community, Rufus Porter, who was a rancher uh, in what's now, we call the, call the core of Spring Valley. And he said, well, let's go climb up the top of that hill there and see what's going on. And when he went up there, he was surprised to find the Helix Aspersia snail, which is basically the European, common European garden snail. But what the heck is that doing way out here in the wilds of California? And so with that, he said, oh, this is like the, 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 the mountain of the helix or something, right? And so then a few years later, when the surveyors came through, the U.S. surveyors came through and they met with Porter because he was the guy who knew the area. They said, what's that place called? He said, oh, that's the Mount Helix. 
And that's supposedly how the story goes. And there's a couple of articles that Porter, interestingly enough, was not writing for the local podunk San Diego Union, which barely had anybody living here. In that time, it was only about 2,300 people living in San Diego at that time. Um, uh, he was actually writing articles that were being published in the San Francisco papers, you know, a real city paper. And in there is a couple of references he has to our Mount Helix. And so that's where the name comes from. So it does come from that. It is, in fact, named for a snail. So everyone asks, why a snail? You're kidding me. No. And that's why, so we were joking, of course, because um, if you go to our little city centennial plaza there at 4th and, uh, and, and La Mesa Boulevard, you'll see uh, Felix the Helix there. And love, the kids love to go up and get their picture with the, why is there a snail? And that has to be because Mount Helix is actually on the city's uh, seal. Of course, Mount Helix isn't in the city of La Mesa. But it's on the seal, not the cross anymore. We'll get into that. But, um, but the, the mountain is, even though it's not in the city limits. So anyway. So then that's where the name comes from. So, of course, and this is a very, as you can see, this I made this map, graphic expert that I am. Um, <laughs> you can see why we have to hire graphics people. Um, it's not me. Uh, but to sort of, sort of the influence of the different neighborhoods and sort of the general area around uh, Mount Helix that we're focused on with Mount Helix sort of this sort of icon, sort of piece in the middle, um, uh, you know, that that sort of everybody looks to and can see. And so, like I said, the city looks at it and it's on their, on their seal and everything. And all the other communities around there sort of generally can say Mount Helix. Though everyone always, of course, in La Mesa election might be, yeah, but your post office is La Mesa, right? But, um, but still, that's sort of the influence. And so we really wanted to make sure that I could cover these areas and understand, you know, why are, and why are they still most, most of it unincorporated when you are surrounded by cities of Lemon Grove, La Mesa, and El Cajon. And of course, you know, history and cultural origins, there's a reason. People have been around this area for quite a while. In fact, we're interesting enough in, in history and archaeology these days, we're actually getting some new dates with some new techniques that may be pushing back Native American occupancy, uh, which always safely we could say was 10 to 12,000 years for sure before present, pushing it closer to 20,000 years. We're getting some very interesting data coming in that will now help us document that we believe that humans have been here at least about 20,000 years uh, living in this area. Um, and so one of the places that, that, that attracted, once not only the Native Americans have been here for a long time, uh, uh, but when the missionaries came, the Spanish missionaries came up from Mexico in 1769 and began to try to you know, um, uh, convert the Indians into their system, their colonial system, all was where can you find a place, especially here, is we all, we're kind of used to having all our water come from a big pipe now. Back, you know, back then we didn't have that. So where water was was important. And then what they named the San Jorge Valley, which is where the Kumeyaay village of Mete or Nete, depending on, on who you're reading, uh, was, was that there's lots of springs. And if we know anything about the, your, your terrain around here, you've got a lot of rock, right? Not much soil on your lots, probably like me, in Boulder Heights, for, named properly for a reason. Um, is that that makes really great for, for course, the creation of springs. And so San Jorge Valley was known because it was Saint, the springs of St. George. And so that's where that name came from, from the missionaries. Um, and it was a place, therefore, where there was water. And at that time, and any time actually before 1945, places with water were pretty darn important here for development in, in the San Diego region. <clears throat> and interestingly enough, you know, over time there was ranchos. So in the Mexican period, a lot of the land was in sort of things changed from the Spanish era. Everything was owned by the king and the church. Uh, those lands were then changed up in the Mexican, after the Mexican Revolution, then it was private land ownership that was allowed to the, to the ruling class. And we began the creation of the Rancho period. And so around this area, we have the Rancho X Mission, which is the one that where La Mesa sits in. You have the El Cajon Rancho. And then, of course, you have the Hamasha Rancho, which is interesting enough, one of the few ranchos deeded to a woman. Um, Doña Alpalaniero Lorenzana. Um, got that she was a uh, known as a pious woman who had helped at the mission for many years and for her years of service as sort of a nurse and caretaker she was given an 8,000 acre grant uh, by the governor which is basically the area that's the Hamasha Rancho San Diego area so one of those stories that doesn't she lost it along with most of the folks from the Mexican era in the next 30 years of long court battles but um, that, that goes back to that. But interesting enough, then, once the Americans arrive in 1848 and uh, take over fully with the state of California in 1850, um, they were then required by law to f prove up those claims. And a lot of these required significant amounts of lawyers over decades and appeals. And so a lot of them were lost or were forced to sell it off. But interestingly, once all the surveyors were done, the area around the springs of Spring Valley were left out. And what I like to say is it's the land cut out in between. And so by the 1860s, most of the folks realized this was open for preemption. It was open for settlement. And so while we saw Spring Valley was the first area to sort of cease development, it was one, it had water, and two, it wasn't within an existing 
private rancho boundary. So therefore, it was open land that could be settled in the new Homestead Act. Lincoln had signed and all those good things during the war, was able to that. And so that's why the Spring Valley right, ended up being the first area with the most of sort of independent farmers. And if that map, it's hard to see, but there's the little dots and there are all the different farmers that were living in Spring Valley by early 1870s. There was a community of, of probably eight or 10 farming families already living in the Spring Valley area trying to turn this soil into something. Um, and of course, that led then to the, some of our earliest settlement communities. And of course, down in the Elkhorn Valley, as that was owned by a large uh, corporation and a couple of different landowners, one named Lankersham, another named Case, Chase, excuse me, Chase. Um, uh, you began to see that, and then the road from San Diego East went through over the what's now the Grosmont Pass, was called the Alta Pass at the time, and then down into the Cajon Valley, and right there at the corner of today's Magnolia and Maine is where Knox had a few acres that he got for working for Mr. Lankersham, and that's how that little area became the center of what later became the city of El Cajon. Um, there was enough people that by 1870, uh, and so there was actually a school in El Cajon um, in 1870. A couple years later, the Hamashaw Spring Valley School was established in 1877. That's a picture of it, the very first schoolhouse. And those are very important for rural communities in America because this is sort of becomes the institutional center. So a schoolhouse would also be used for church services or meetings or, or, or events and things because there really wasn't any other kind of community area. And so schoolhouses, you'll see this, whether it's the Midwest or through the Plains or whatever, you know, the Southwest, it's very American. You got to build a school. And then once you have a school, that gives you that sort of civic centerpiece to which all the other institutions have a place to connect and you create community. And of course, then the picture down below of Porter's Ranch. And as you can see, we don't have the pipes with the big water. Um, so you don't quite see the vegetation <laughs> that you might see today because in fact, we do really only average about 10 inches of rain a year. And usually as we know, this year we'll get our 20, next year we'll probably get two. Um, and that's sort of how it works out, it averages to 10, right? Um, so that's sort of the thing. So that gives you that they're beginning to see some settlement out here in this area around Mount Helix. Uh, and then Southern California really, really sort of connects in in the 1880s. In 18, uh, by 1875, the railroad had made it to Los Angeles from the north, and eventually by 1877 would be off towards Arizona from L.A. Uh, San Diego would be connected in the early 1880s. Uh, and the great boom Southern California occurs in 1885 when the Santa Fe and the Southern Pacific begin a rate war that makes it very inexpensive to come out to Southern California. Uh, at the same time, the citrus industry had become sort of the first sort of economic boom for Southern California. Guess you can grow oranges year round. And then now with this train, you can ship them back east and make, send an orange to New York in, in, in February. There's big money to be made here, right? So you begin to see this sort of effort and suddenly Southern California is now connected. San Diego is connected. And so at that point in 1885, the city population of San Diego is 5,000. Uh, it is estimated that by late 1887, the population was pushing 40,000. So this is when San Diego gets sewer lines, streetcars, uh, water systems, piping, all those kinds of things, paved streets. You're beginning to see this sort of boom. And so then it also causes this huge speculative boom that all the hinterlands around are subdivided out. And around this area, of course, people were not looking for housing, they were looking for farms. Most of them assuming they're gonna get into the citrus industry. And so when I'll show you that, the, one of the companies that figured it out was the San Diego Flume Company. Is that me? No, oh, it's at you. Okay, oh, sorry. I turn mine off, usually my wife calls me right and says, what are you doing today? I'm lecturing, I'm lecturing. Uh, she's, hello, hi Jennifer, we're recording this, aren't we? Okay, I'm in trouble. Uh, so, um, so anyway, so was an interesting group of folks who said, you know, it rains about 20 inches a year every year in Koyamaka Mountains. Hmm. hmm, if we could just get the water from up there, down here, we're gonna be able to, our land is gonna be valuable. People will actually buy our land because we'll have water. If you're gonna be a citrus, especially if you're in the citrus, you gotta have lots of water. That's what makes it work, right? And so they actually are the ones who built the original dam at Cuyamaca Lake, which is well, part of uh, the, state, the state park up there, right next to the state park, um, to dam the water, then divert it down what is now would be uh, the diversion dam, which is right about the long end of El Capitan Reservoir, and then through about a 30-mile route of flumes and bridges and tunnels to get it up around the Elkhorn Valley, over the pass, and to its stopping point, which was right here at Briarcrest Park. This was the end of the flume line, right here. So that was the Eucalyptus Reservoir. And from there, two different branches went. One, a ditch went out to the new La Mesa Reservoir, which you all know is Lake Murray, and the other down the west side of Mount Helix into Lemon Grove and Spring Valley, which was known as the Lemon Grove Spring Valley flume. And they were basically ditches that got the water from this holding tank out to that, so that they then 
you saw people coming and subdividing in a lot of cases five and ten acre lots because you're assuming you're going to sell these to folks to make farms. And so what you got out of that was, and you can see actually Government Waterman is if they're sitting when the, when it opened in 1889 they. They got to ride little flume boats down there and everything, and that's the diverting dam and one of the tunnels and flumes that you see. And there were several, several amazing, there's some great pictures out here in the hallway too of this, right? In the meantime, folks weren't, weren't going to let the Sweetwater River go without doing something about it. And interesting enough, a fellow by the name of James Shiler, who was a, an early civil engineer, designed what at the time was the largest masonry, unreinforced masonry dam, which is still the Sweetwater Dam, was opened in 1888. Um, and still there. It's been updated and reforced a couple times, but it's still there uh, and holding that Sweetwater Reservoir. So you're beginning to see that need. And of course, so then around that area, people saw the ability to put the land around that. And so literally the, there were subdivisions, and you may recognize these names, Helix, La Presa, San Miguel, all around the reservoir, all around the area that's Spring Valley, was suddenly so, uh, subdivided. And of course, the Helix Post Office, which would have been right in the heart of Spring Valley, right there, and looking back up, was, was done, and as you can see how well the sales were going, they were selling a lot of lots, not a lot of people moving in, but a lot of lots. So there was a lot of speculation going on, but certainly this was the big chance there's going to be a community right around this area because we have water, we have everything we need, the railroad, this is, this is going to make it work. And that railroad was the other key, right, for this area. And so what today you know is the trolley, the MTB trolley line, was originally the, Sa the San Diego and Cuyamaca Eastern Railroad. It was partially financed by Governor Waterman, which is, of course, interesting because he, along with a fellow named Robert Allison, who happened to own about 4,000 acres around here uh, in La Mesa, um, and also was, they were both part owners of the ranch of Cuyamaca, thought this great way to get San Diego to not have to worry about Los Angeles, because everything had to go up to Los Angeles, right, to get out east was to try to figure out a way to get a route, a direct railroad route. So their plan was to take that railroad from San Diego. They were following up what that was known as the Federal Route, which is Federal Highway 94, that route that way, right? Through what is now Lemon Grove, turn Spring Valley Station, where the Spring Valley Trolley Station is now. It's the same location. Down here into Allison, because this was known as Allison Springs. So basically south of University Avenue, uh, La Mesa, down into Lemon Grove, 4,000 acres, was owned by Robert Allison. And so the springs that are now in Collier Park were known as Allison Springs, and the overall area was known as Allison Springs. So when the first stations opened in 1889, that's the Allison Station, which is also why that would become the Allison School. Um, and we'll get into how that name changes. But anyway, and then the Alta Station is the one that's up, that was up close to where Grossmont High School is now. And so you're getting that part. So you've got this going, and they got the railroad all the way up to Foster, which is just on the other side of the river from Lakeside. And there they ran out of money because what had happened was that great boom busted in 1889, about the time they finished all this infrastructure and had spent all the money they had borrowed, not a good thing, up to that point to create this. And so you suddenly had this boom bust. And so what we talk about is that the population in San Diego, which had peaked somewhere around 40,000, dropped back down and settled at about 16,000 in 1890 and stayed almost the same for the whole decade of the 90s. By 1900, San Diego's population had risen to a whopping 17,000 because due to some economic problems, droughts and other things, not much happened. It sort of settled out. But we had the infrastructure, but not a lot was going on at that time. But you had this sort of infrastructure settled in there. And people did move out, but it wasn't in the numbers, of course, they, they thought. In the meantime, that whole area around the pass um, that got you from the Mesa, which was the name, of course, the, the um, Spanish uh, missionaries who were down in Mission Valley, said to all the tablelands to their south. So pretty much anything from about I-805 east up to Helix was known generally as the Mesa, the tableland. Sort of makes sense, right? You're down the valley, you look up this big flat sort of flat-ish sort of thing up till you get to Helix. That was the Mesa. That's where the origin of that name comes from. So the pass here was a couple of guys who didn't owned different parts, the Alta Ranch and the Via Caro Rancho, uh, a fellow by the name of Johnson, another guy named Marshall. Does that sound familiar to El Cajonians? Um, yeah, those are the guys who owned those ranches. And so this shows you sort of a feature, which the Alta Ranch included that whole of the pass, pretty much now what is Fletcher Hills. And the Via Caro is sort of that I'll call it sort of the northeast corner of Grossmont that pushes down towards Chase Avenue. Of course, Mr. Chase owned all the south half of the valley, uh, and that's where Chase Avenue comes from. His house was down there. And so you're getting a piece. And interestingly enough, Mar Marshall's Ranch uh, is, was built a lovely home there on the hillside on the sort of the northeast facing of the Grossmont Hill. And then Hervey Park. Hervey Park actually was like many of the folks. Now, the folks who did move to Southern California, and by the way, Los Angeles was getting a lot more folks than here in San Diego. There was the boom from 1880 to 1920. 
the vast majority of people were coming in from the Midwest. Uh, so it was for, we joke, the historians, we said, well, this is sort of the wasp invasion of Southern California. Um, and because most of them were coming out, they're either for two reasons, one for health. So if you're living in the Midwest and you're having some kind of, say, issue with lung diseases or something, the doctors would say, well, you need to go as a dry climate. Why don't you, you can get a train now to Southern California. You should move to Southern California. So you were getting a lot of health prescription sort of things. The other was, hey, do you know there's no weather out there? <laughs> what a great place to retire. So you would see a lot of people who had made some money in the Midwest say, you know, I am going to take my money and I'm going to go out and buy one of these cool dream visions. And if you ever see anything on like citrus labels, there's this, you know, archaic, this idyllic uh, vision of Southern California life with snow-capped mountains and orange groves blooming in February and all that. Hey, sounds better than shoveling snow, right? Or what they're going through this year. Huh? So you saw this huge move of people generally who had something. They had some means. They were coming out here to sort of second career, semi-retire, and just get away from having to worry about weather. Because, of course, the, the promotions here were very clear. We have no weather. It's, it's, the, it's America's, you know, Riviera, that kind of thing. So come on out. So you see that. Hervey Park was the heir to the Park Davis Pharmaceutical Company. And, and that little pond is actually a natural spring-fed pond. You know it if you're sitting at Anthony's um, and looking out at it today. And so that little dam they put on the side was actually because the other side of that is where the flume is, and right on the other side of the flume was where the railroad is, right? So he built, the, we always joke because if you look up close up at that photo, the barn is way nicer than the house. It looks really awesome. Um, it's most the fanciest barn I think I've ever seen built around Southern California. Well, maybe other than Will Rogers, but that's a different issue. Uh, so anyway, just to give you an idea. So you have this sort of gentleman's ranch sort of thing going. So this is sort of the, the beginnings of looking at this sort of area as a place where you might have a small sort of agricultural thing where you're sort of semi-retiring. And this is going to go through the development of Mount Helix as well in the 20s and 30s especially. I'm still trying to sell this area as sort of this idyllic place where you can come and sort of have another career, sort of semi-retire out here in the land of no weather and big oranges. So anyway. So this is just give you so another map to sort of get you an idea of the flume system. Eventually, the La Mesa Reservoir will be renamed, but that was originally, and I think they finished around 1893. In fact, that dam is still there. It's about 100 feet in front of the concrete dam uh, underwater. Just most of the time, especially this year, it's underwater. Uh, when in really low years, you can sometimes see the top of it still there. So, but in the meantime, there wasn't like no one was living here, certainly. Um, you had people coming in enough to create community um, schools. The Hillsdale School is out in the area we know today as Hamishaw, closer to where Valhalla High is, the original Hillsdale School, that is. Uh, Eucalyptus Park along the Bancroft Road, still a county park, was a place that the Spring Valley folks, in fact, it was, I believe it was um, one of, uh, I think it was Porter's son-in-law who planted the initial eucalyptus in that area. And it was a place there that became, it had a little bit of shade, so the community would go out there for picnics and have events, starting as far back as 1880s and 90s. Um, but you also saw sort of, you know, the sort of standard Scrabble Ranch, the Hink family, who basically had about five, six acres there uh, off of Mariposa, sort of the Highlands, um, Spring Valley area, Highlands area today, uh, and leading to a fairly small and, and um, but, you know, fairly successful in, in its way um, uh, citrus industry. Now, the problem that really killed the citrus industry and why we didn't take off like Riverside or Redlands or those kinds of places, Ventura County, was that we didn't have the water sources that they had in the LA Basin and all. And so you need, the more water, you want sweet citrus, you need lots of water. So interesting enough, both El Cajon, this area, and Chula Vista became more known for lemons, um, simply because it didn't take quite as much water because you didn't get them quite as sweet. And so for most of the folks, and Lemon Grove is the perfect name of those community around there, right, um, to have that, and so there was a picture. So we did have it, but there was a big problem that in 1897, um, a, a, about a seven-year significant drought period hit. And it pretty much destroyed the citrus industry. And in fact, that flume company I was talking about in 1899 went into receivership to its, its London creditors uh, and was taken over in receivership because they were so far upside down. And they couldn't produce either water to get revenue in or revenue because no one had any water, right? And so basically they, they went into foreclosure, which sort of put a little damper on the ability to expand the citrus industry here in this area. And so that's sort of one of the key pieces to that. And that's going to be an effect when then the sort of suburban speculators are going to come in a little later. And with, but still, by the time as things begin to pick up again in San Diego County, um, after the opening of the Panama Canal, the announcement we're going to have a big exposition, San Diego is going to you know, take off, you begin to see uh, every decade the county probably doubling its population. 
Here we saw small growth, but it's, you know, San Diego City is going to go from 17,000 in 1900 to something like 39,000 people in 1910. It's going to be over 75,000 in 1920. It's going to be pushing 100,000 by 1930. So you get the idea. At the same time, you know, LA is going from 10,000 to by 1920 almost a million people, right? So I give you the idea of sort of the different scale. But we're all moving in this sort of exponential growth. So in the meantime, with some new laws, uh, the city of La Mesa and the city of El Cajon, and actually the same year, the next year, the city of East San Diego are going to incorporate. Because at that time, you only needed 600 residents if you could set your boundary and get enough of them to vote for it. And if you've ever seen my lecture on the incorporation, I do a whole series on that. Fascinating story of how we went from 600 sort of people thinking we're going to become a suburban to suddenly being a city and having to deal with all that fun. El Cajon, the same thing. They actually had even less people at the time. Uh, of incorporation uh, about nine months after La Mesa. Um, in the meantime, so infrastructure became important because as the number of people began to, to grow. So like in 1900, we estimate the area around here, about 100 families living here. By 1910, that's going to be closer to 600 in the area that's La Mesa. Uh, and by 1912, when they incorporate, there's around 700 people living in what today is pretty much the south part of the city of La Mesa. So not including the Helix area. So just giving that idea, still not huge numbers compared to today, right? You have the more people in your neighborhood probably today, but um, they give you that set. So how do you deal with that? And the original city of La Mesa, I was going to mention this to you, was, was set up by the Flume Company. And there was an area called the Town Site. And the center of today, if you want to find the center of the La Mesa Town Site, you go to 70th and Elkhorn Boulevard. Because that was south of the dam. And so that's where the city of La Mesa was going to be on the Cajon Road. The, what's University Avenue was the Choice Road. The Cajon Road via the Mesa was, when it became El Cajon Boulevard eventually, right, that route. And so since that was directly south of the dam, that's where they thought they should put the town site. And so if you, and you'll notice if you look at a map from six, what's now 67th Street to 73rd, two blocks north, one south, there's a nice little grid there. That's where La Mesa, and that's where the original La Mesa school was. The original La Mesa Methodist Church was there. And that was La Mesa if you were there in 1890. But as... This, when, the post, when the railroad ends up in Allison Springs, of course, the post office ends up not being called Alice, La Mesa. They, just, they, they wanted to make a change. In 1894, uh, Andrew Crowder comes in, buys some land from Allison, subdivides right around the um, depot, and, and decides to name it La Mesa Springs. The th only issue was there was already a La Mesa Springs post office in Texas, so they couldn't name this post office. So they had to name the post office La Mesa, not La Mesa Springs. So... As time is going on, people started referring to Allison Springs and then La Mesa Springs. And then by 1910 or so, when they're thinking of getting ready to think about incorporation, they, 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 they actually thought about naming the city La Mesa Springs, but realizing that the post office was called La Mesa, that that would be confusing. And so what they basically did was they just took the name and said, no, it's going to be the city of La Mesa. And you guys up there in the old town site, you're called, now called La Mesa Heights. And so they converted the school up there to La Mesa Heights School. And that area was known up until about 1930 as La Mesa Heights, that whole western end around where we are up there. And so that's how that sort of comes. And interestingly enough, there was the little Allison School and the little Spring Valley School. And La Mesa was growing so fast, they were desperately trying to figure out how they were going to deal with their little one. They added a room to it, but two-room schoolhouse still wasn't going to be enough for a community of 700. So they merged with the Spring Valley, and that's the origins of our La Mesa Spring Valley School District in 1914 and put the money together to build the Grammar School, which was the only school from 1914 to 1942 in the La Mesa Spring Valley area, K-8. to That was it, where everybody went to that school. Finally, they opened Spring Valley School in 42, Lemon Avenue the next year, um, and that began to spread out. And eventually, after the war, of course, many more schools. Anyway, so that's its own story, too, but we'll get into that. You can read it in the book. Did we get there? Come on now. There we go. So now I'm not going to tell you everything that's in the book because you, you need to buy the book, right? Uh, but um, oops, let's go back one. Um, but we have a lot of fa fascinating things going on. You know, in 1911, uh, La Mesa, uh, and uh, for a few months before this in Lakeside, was the site of the pioneering Flyne Film Company. Uh, right there, if you go downtown and you see the plaque we have on the building, still there, the Stokes Building, which is now, I think, mostly Mission Furniture, uh, is where they, this pioneering film company, made about 100 silent films. We... Uh, we know of about 13 that still exist. We have copies of two we sell and a couple more we can show. Um, and uh, just a fascinating thing. And Alan Dwan, who was the head of that company, went on to a huge career. Um, uh, he directed everybody from uh, Fairbanks, Douglas Fairbanks, Shirley Temple, John Wayne, in about a 50-year film career. A pioneer of 
learn how to do it right here. Uh, they were here about a year before Santa Barbara offered them an entire city block. They, they quickly ran off to that big town of 15,000 uh, because they knew they wanted to do a few more things than just Westerns. Um, because pretty much it, we had about a few storefronts and, and otherwise they're out in the, in the brush. Uh, the, some of the, the, the one of the film that I think a lot of people love is the poison flume, um, which you get to see the flume, you get to see drugged cattle, um, and other and some really actually decent um, cinematography uh, for 1911. <laughs> uh, if you get a chance to see those, well, we do those events sometimes. I'll have to re resurrect some of those. We love those film programs. Um, the El Granito Springs, which is basically at the base of where Avocado Boulevard comes into El Cajon now. Um, the Murray Hill Reservoir, which is now the park right up here, Griff Park, right? There's still a reservoir underneath, it's just now a big tank, but that was originally put in by um, the uh, Cuyamaca Water Company, who in 1910 decided to buy up the flume from the creditors uh, and, and redo it, and I'll, I'll mention that in a minute. Um, and then the guy company's eggplant, because this is also the beginning to see that the water issues, even though you know we'd have our years that the drought sort of wouldn't be too bad, was that people realized that the poultry business didn't need quite as much water. And so from the 19-teens up until the 1930s, all the area of Maryland Heights in the northern part of today's city, all around Helix um, into western La Mesa, the area of Rolando, became poultry territory. And in fact, I'll talk a little about Grossman High School being the poultry champions in 1927, uh, Southern California School poultry champions, uh, and as well when things were a little more agricultural. And then of course, one of the most famous stories is the Isham Springs. This is at basically uh, the springs uh, at the corner of what's now Sweetwater and Hamishaw. Um, Isham was one of those great guys who was dealing in the patent medicine industry of the 1890s, uh, 1880s and 90s. Now, you all know about the story of Coca-Cola having cocaine in it. Uh, that was a pretty regular thing. You had all kinds of concoctions, usually it's just full of opiates and other things that, no matter what you were feeling, you'd maybe feel better for a little while. It wouldn't cure you, probably just addicted you. And that was, and, and so it was the muckraking um, journalism of the early part of the century that was able to create this thing we all know as the Food and Drug Act of 196, which said, hey, you need to let people know what's in there and you need to make sure it's not stuff that is like killing them as well as making them feel better for a few minutes. Um, and so Isham was one of those ones that was called out by some of the journalists back east because they, of course, claimed that their mineral water would cure everything from baldness to impotence to you name it. They, it will cure it. Just drink our water, buy it by the case, right? Um, and so he was kind of called out for that. And there's several really good articles that were done on Isham Springs uh, pulling him out uh, for the fact that it was not, it was just water. It was just water with some minerals in it. So uh, anyway, so those are some of the stories that you'll get a chance to read about in there. And there are just a few of the fascinating little individual stories of people and pioneers of the area. Now, I mentioned to you this Cuyamaca Water Company. And the Cuyamaca Water Company comes from a fellow uh, that you probably have heard the name of. His name is Ed Fletcher. All right. So Ed Fletcher had come to uh, California or come to San Diego from Massachusetts in the boom of the 1880s as a young teen, he actually was a teenager, I think 17 or 18 years old, and started working as sort of a produce salesman and learning the back country and became very much a progressive sort of person at the time, uh, both politically and as a leader in the community, realizing that if we just had water and, and transportation, we could make this country, this back country into valuable real estate and develop it. And so he was, he was really what I like to call a venture capitalist. He was usually the guy who put in the 10% and then he'd find somebody to put in the 90%. But he had the ideas, he knew the people, he knew the politics. And he happened to be on a trip back um, from, he went out with his wife, was also from Massachusetts. They, they came back um, on a trip and ended up going through Yellowstone National Park and meeting a fellow by the name of William Gross. Now Gross was a guy who had made his money in theater in New York. Um, and was looking as one of those guys to move to California to get away, sort of have a secondary sort of half career, just try to get away, do something that wasn't going to, the crazy theater business of New York City. And so he convinced them, there's this land for sale, this Alta Ranch, Hervey Park had just died, and there's all this land sitting there, perfect location, it's on the railroad, there's water, we just, you know, we got to make this work. And so he was able to convince Gross to go in with him on buying this property, and being the smart marketing guys, they decided not to call anything Mount Gross or... So they said, Grossmont, much better, very good thinking, Grossmont. Um, and so they ended up subdividing what we know now as Grossmont. And their idea being that 
uh, gross new people in the in the entertainment industry was that it would be a, an artist colony, sort of this idea of California as a place of, of Arcadian, bohemian sort of life. You could come out here, create new societies, and you saw this from very religious organizations to very sort of open, liberal, sort of live with nature. It, it ties into the arts and crafts movement and all those things that were going, get back, that sort of antithesis to the urbanization that the country was going through, right? So you, now most people are moving towards cities where all the jobs are, and you're industrializing the, the country. This was a sort of get back to your roots, the natural stuff, make your home out of real wood and stone and live out in the country on the land, in the open air, all those kinds of things. And so they decided, and that shot down there is some of the in, initial investors there at the peak of Grossmont uh, uh, there. Um, Mr. Gross is in the far back of the, of the there, Fletcher on the left, Gross and then a couple of other folks in the middle there who hopefully were going to invest, uh, and other things to promote this area. So they were the first to come in. They subdivided in 1906. They resubdivided again in 1910 because at that point, Fletcher had found a guy from Montana by the name of James Murray. Murray had made significant money in railroad land and cattle and was looking for investments. And so they basically bought the entire water company from the creditors in England for $150,000. They bought the entire flume system, all the dam rights, everything, uh, and took it over and renamed it the Cuyamaca Water Company and tried to get it running. So one, they could put water to their lands, but also eventually their goal was to sell that system to the city of San Diego where most people were living because domestic water rates were way better than agricultural water rates. And so if you really wanna make money, you need to be able to have urban customers, not just rural customers. And so, as well as then, he helps Murray, and they buy all the land today in the, what's known as the, was known at the time as the Alto Elko and Heights, which is all the Fletcher Hill area as well. Why that area, Murray Hill Reservoir, all that. They also bought a little strip of land right above what's now Helix High School that was also known as the Murray, uh, as Murray, as Murray Heights for a little while. So, give me an idea. So, this is what's going on. So, I'll tell you a little bit about that story. And, of course, boy, it's moving slow today. Come on, we can do it. There we go. Come on. No, not yet. There we go. Big must be go. And so you really, it's interesting now. Yeah, they opened in 1910, 11, you know, they're really going. And they were able to, the most famous person they invited was a famed um, opera singer by the name of Ernestine schumann Heink, an Austrian gal. And that's her house. It still sits there on, uh, I think it's Sierra Vista, um, there in the grandson that still owns it. Um, and she was the first to sort of come in and promote. And she sort of becomes the sort of, uh, iconic person living, hey, artists, and, and then other, there were pianists and vocalists and writers. Um, that's the John Lewis house there, uh, Ed Fletcher's Grossmont Inn down here on the left, and showing you sort of that arts and crafts style, this sort of lifestyle, that's the guy home, um, the guy uh, married into the schumann Hike family. Um, to give you an idea that they were on the cutting edge. So this is cutting edge architecture here. This is really stuff coming out. It's, it's influenced by prairie style as well as craftsmen and arts and crafts. And so they are looking for that sort of, uh, you know, artisan sort of uh, thing to create an artist colony here. Uh, as you can see, there's still a lot of empty lots around them. Not that many houses are built in the teens, but there are a few. And you begin to see them try to create this space and it sort of sets the tone for the area. So. So by the teens, you know, just a few houses are going to be built, but they tend to be, well, the, probably the most famous person who was also going to live here uh, was a guy named Owen Wister. And you may know there's a Wister Street and there's Molly Woods in Virginia because he, in 1902, probably published what today most liter American literature scholars would say is this sort of perfect Western book, The Virginian. It sets the tone of the silent, you know, sort of stoic, John Wayne-esque character, John Wayne would fall on this, right, of the, of the quiet man who goes out and does what needs to be done, even when it's dirty, all that kind of stuff. And, and, but he's always there to help the school marm and all that kind of thing. That whole, that whole story setup comes from that novel. It was hugely successful. Gross knew him, they had talked to him, he literally had acreage, they were planting avocado orchards, his house was under construction in 1915 when his wife died. And he decided he didn't want to move out here without her. And so he let it go and they ended up selling it. But Worcester, that whole western part of Grossmont with all this, the Virginian, Molly Woods, right, all those, that the characters from the book, that, that area was all set up to try to draw people to, hey, Owen Worcester's gonna live here. Yeah, he's one of the most famous authors in the whole country, right? So that was sort of the level they were shooting for. Didn't quite get there, um, but, they, but they were trying. In the meantime, there are some other things going on in the area. My goodness, there we go. Um, and, and one of the things that, as I say, in La Mesa was sort of happening, and I, if we have time, I could go through the whole more detailed history of, um, of how the Easter services started here. But they actually start on Mount Nebo in La Mesa. 
Uh, the earliest I can see a sort of general reference might have been 1912. Certainly there's a, some notes in the paper about 1913 of the neighbors who are living in the Mount Nebo area of downtown would hike up or were hiking up for the for sunrise on Easter. And in 1914, 15, and 16, they actually had official full-on events um, there. And in 1917, they decided to cancel because of the war, the, you know, war effort, they didn't want to deal with it. In the meantime, the San Diego Advertising Club decided to hold their own event on Mount Helix without really telling anybody about their club members. And in 1917, they drove up to the top with the permission of, of Ed Fletcher, who, along with some other investors, had purchased the Mount Helix area in 1916, and said, hey, can we drive up your dirt road and do a thing on Easter morning? The next year, the San Diego Advertising Club sort of announced it as a big event, sort of upset the local Mesa. So wait a minute, we, this is our event. But they worked it out, and from that time on, every Easter sunrise service has been on Mount Helix. Now, interestingly enough, one of the investors in the Mount Helix subdivision with Fletcher was a guy named Frank, uh, Fred, Fred, Fred White. And his wife was in with the Yaki family. Yes, related to the Yaki family of Boston and the Red Sox, but actually the really wealthy Wisconsin lumbering family, Yaki's. And there is Miss Yaki there and her son, Cyrus. And when she, so they brought her out one, um, one Easter to visit and took her up there, up in the, and at the time they would just build a little sort of like wooden stage for the, for the or altar for the, for the reverend and then everybody would just sort of sit on rocks and hang out around on the top of the hill to watch the services. And she went up there and said, this is really great. I wish it was a little more comfortable. Uh, and so when she passed away in 1923, uh, the Whites and the Yaquis came together and said, we will pay to have an appropriate theater made here so that everybody could come up every Easter and enjoy it. And that's how we get the, 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 the theater, the nature theater. In 1925, it was completed, designed by the local architect Richard Requa, mostly known for his Spanish colonial revival extravaganza homes, but also an arts and crafts trained guy who, who designed this, this beautiful park. And that's, that opened in 1925. Yeah, it's going slowly. Come on. There we go. So, so that's the story of that. So, and we can go into more. In the meantime, other things are happening. As these communities are growing, the, you know, up until, um, well, in 1893, they were realizing that there were no secondary schools in East County. There was a small school in Julian that basically was the grammar school that they would teach for whatever students they had who wanted to continue on. They would teach it, and, and today that evolved into what's now Julian High School. But at the time, until 1892, there was no high school at East, outside of San Diego High School, Escondido High School, Sweetwater, what would be, later become National City High School. Uh, I think those were the only ones originally. And, um, and so then you had uh, some effort made in 1892 to create the El Cajon Valley High School. And this was brought together by several school districts. And in the last minute, um, they decided that Alpine bailed out and it set the whole thing back and it took them the next year. But in 1893, out near Bostonia, about where second, second or third street, but between second and third street out there, um, opened the original El Cajon Valley School. But it was a fairly small school. And for folks in La Mesa and the other outside of San Diego City schools, it really didn't make sense to go, because how are you going to get out there? If this is the time you think in the 1890s, there's no, no automobiles. If you don't have a horse or a buckboard, how are you going to get all the way from La Mesa to Bostonia, right? The railroad didn't go over there. So usually most of the folks in La Mesa would get on the train and drive, you know, take the train into town if they were going to go to high school at San Diego High School. Um, that worked all great until 1912 when La Mesa and El Cajon Incorporate, now they're not paying into the county tax school taxes because they're in a city. So suddenly San Diego High School is saying, uh, you're not paying in, you really shouldn't be sending. So they made a deal to like anybody who was already started, they let them finish and they let you apply for out of district, but it was a hassle. And so the area out here realized they needed something. Uh, and the folks out in Lakeside were feeling the same concern. So in 1916, a second high school called Riverview was created. But once again, fairly small school. They realized that it wasn't convenient for anybody in La Mesa or in the western end of El Cajon um, to get to either of these schools. And so finally in 1920, everybody sort of gets together and it happens to be Mr. Fletcher who comes together and says, look, you guys need a place that's easy to get to and, and is, is central and all that. So I will give you, Murray and I will, will I'll give you some land right at the peak there at Alta Pass or the Grossmont Pass as they were calling it now. And they donated. The fact is, if you don't know, there's, there was a quarry across the road. It's probably, it's like the slow lanes of the eastbound <laughs> eight now. But, um, but uh, or, the, or they're not slow anymore. None of the lanes are slow. But anyway, the offbound lanes right there. Um, 
And so that's where they, and he also offered up all the stone. And that's why the old school that opened in 1922 is all stone block quarried from right across the road there. And so they donated that, and that, of course, then turned out to be Grossmont High School. Riverview and, and El Cajon Valley closed, um, and, or became grammar schools or something, I think is what happened. And then Grossmont became the high school. So you had that going on. Um, the country club was, is the area in Spring Valley, if you know where 94 and 125 meet. Up on the top of the hill there now is the um, Trinity Church, but that's where the clubhouse was for the La Mesa Country Club. And all along that slope that comes down the, there was the La Mesa Country Club. From 1921 to 28, it was all dirt fairways, only, only turf on the greens, good old school. 1928, they went all turf. Um, and so that's right. And then, of course, later, as you might know, it was sold off and became the Brookside um, subdivision in 1951, and that's why there's Gulf Street and all fairway lane and all that stuff. Okay, some other fun little stuff uh, is is La Mesa did, needed a cemetery, and if you happen to live currently east of Bancroft, north of Lemon, um, that's where the cemetery was. And so I always joke with those folks: be careful when you're building your your swimming pools. You never know. No, no, they moved everybody. They supposedly moved everybody, but um, that was where the cemetery was, and it was going to be a big green park, and it, it got going. They, they used it for about 15 years before a developer bought the land and turned it into housing tracks, and they did move all the bodies, just so you wonder wondering about that. But probably the most important piece that a phase in why we all don't live in the city of San Diego today is what happened with that Cuyamaca Water Company. About 1924, so, so what had happened was, the Flume Company, of course, had the rights to the dams and everything, but the city of San Diego always claimed that they had the initial water rights going back to the Mexican and Spanish period based on initial water rights that came with those grants. So several times Fletcher kept trying to sell, Murray was on board with this, sell the water company to the city so that they could get out. It was a very costly thing to run this. They had to completely, all the flumes were leaking and in the tunnels. So they were constantly pouring money into it. Really wasn't making them any money, but they knew that infrastructure needed to be there and they kept trying to sell it. And the city attorneys kept telling the city council, we don't need to buy anything. It's our water, you know, just we're gonna kill them in court. That court case took about 15 years <laughs> to settle. And so in the meantime, about 1923, C.S. Smith, who was the editor of both the La Mesa and El Cajon papers, had decided, hey, you guys, we need to get control of this. And so he then, the, 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 the irrigation district, so today you all know it as a helix, but the La Mesa Spring Valley and, uh, and Lemon Grove Irrigation District, that's a tongue, right, um, was created in 1912, actually, as a distributor of water, because they didn't have any water source. They were buying water from the Flume Company or whoever, but they created this, this, this entity, a, a public irrigation district. So with a big rally in support of Fletcher and, and the community in Smith, they were able to rally the folks here in La Mesa, Lemon Grove, Spring Valley, and El Cajon to vote for the creation, for the sale, excuse me, of the irrigation district to, uh, or for the Flume Company, I'm throwing you out here, the Cuyamaca Water Company into the Flume Irrigation District. So what happens basically is a $2.5 million bond act is posted. And the community votes something like 75% to basically fund that and purchase the water company and give it to the irrigation district. So that happens in 1925. And that's why that sale is so important. Because then when the, the court finally renders in 1928 on the case, and says, you're right, the water rights belong to the city. However, you need to pay the irrigation district for their improvements. That's when the city buys Lake Murray, the El Capitan Dan site, and has to pay the irrigation district for those improvements. And a guy named Chet Herrett, and you may see his name, I think it's over at Jennings, right? Chet Herrett, who was in charge of the irrigation, said, okay, I only have one other little deal that we need to make here, is that when, if we run out of water, we're the last taps to get shut off. We always get the top two feet of El Capitan Dam's water. In other words, you gotta shut your taps off before you shut us. That independence of having water is why after four or five attempts, some more significant than others, to get City of San Diego to incorporate this area, we didn't have to because we had water. And so that's why we all stayed independent. There was no need to annex into the services of the city of San Diego. And if you know, if you've ever seen a map of San Diego, it goes all the way up to San Pasqual Valley, all the way down to San Ysidro. There's tentacles all over, you know, the octopus in a different version, right? We don't have to worry about that. We're independent. And that's why we still are independent, is we had our own water source. 
And that was a key thing. And so of all those things that happened in the 20s, that's probably the most important to why there still is a city of San Diego. Eventually, Lemon Grove would incorporate El Cajon, Spring Valley, and all the unincorporated areas could survive because we didn't have to count on another entity to bring us the water. Now, San, Southern California, like I said, is steady gonna steadily grow. Um, and probably one of the most, um, you know, important things was sort of this a secondary boom that hits in the 1920s. So once again, Southern California has a huge boom in the 1920s. Now we've got some more industries kind of punching money into in Southern California. If you're up north of us, you've got the petroleum industry making big money. And this newfangled thing I mentioned, the flying A, the entertainment and film business in Los Angeles, right? Huge wealth and things and population. And the whole idea of creating sort of a suburban storybook sort of landscape. And so on, along comes a guy from Illinois by the name of Fred Hansen. Fred had made a lot of money in a thing called cyclone fencing, right? The fences that don't blow down in the big storms, right? Because they got holes in them. So um, he had made it. He came out here looking to sort of, sort of start over. He bought most of the land on the east side of Helix away from uh, Fletcher and, and the company. He also bought that area I was talking about that was the, um, the cemetery and turned it into a thing called the Avocado uh, Villas and started subdividing it. And he had this great thing because what had happened recently was um, we had had avocados in, in California from early part of the century, but it wasn't until some cooperatives came together in sort of mixed varieties to make them a little more palatable. And I guess some of the early versions are sort of like, you know, hand grenades or like you have to chisel them out or something to make them more palatable. And it became this thing of they then sold it as the, as the Cal Avocado or the Calavo cooperative that came together with this idea of, look, just realize these things grow on the sides of hills. They don't need much water and soil. Um, this is the greatest thing. And so Hansen connected this idea of gentlemen's ranches with, hey, and put an acre of avocados that grow three or four crops a year. They'll grow on the side of your rocky hill. This is great. And that sort of way comes where the selling point for the Helix Calavo, and of course, Calavo Gardens, pretty, pretty out there, right? I mean, that's pretty straightforward in your face. And uh, uh, John um, Cornelius's Casa de Oro, or the the House of Gold Avocado Estates, Casa de Oro, uh, all comes in this late 20s period as they subdivide with this dream that you'll have this Mediterranean revival home surrounded by the orchards of, of avocados that will grow all the time, anytime, on your rocky soil. It's the dream life. Here, come get it in, in the Mount Helix Calavo area. And so that really sort of gets it. And, 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 and so in that interwar era, um, you begin to see a change. So here's a shot of Grossman and, and Helix in about 1928, 29. You can see a few houses out there. By 1939, a similar view, you see in a lot more development, right? Still not full on, but certainly you begin to see it. And so that period, even though the depression is going on, you see steady growth in, in this area for people coming in, buying a couple acres, putting in a house, throwing some avocados on it, and making a little income as well as having your dream house outside, in most of the cases, outside of the city, of either city, El Cajon or El Cajon, so you don't have to pay those taxes, you just pay the county taxes. Wasn't well, it a great deal? Come and live out here. So, But it is until after World War II that things really take off. Um, and that's for a couple reasons. If you know anything about the World War II boom in San Diego County, that was another one. Within three years, once, once the U.S. is starting engaging in the war. So in, you know, the war in Europe starts in 1939. Japan is already doing their thing in China by that point. Um, the threats coming on, we began to start selling um, planes and armaments to Britain, who's suddenly holding out by, on their own by 1940. We see this huge growth in our two little um, uh, aircraft industries, the one consolidated aircraft of Reuben Fleet, and then Solar and Roar, I guess, are the other two small ones who are helping out, as well as the fact that we're a major naval base. San Diego's population is going to double in two years. It's going to go from 200,000 to 400,000 in about two and a half, three years. So there's a huge need. So even though a lot of subdivisions have been put out as far back as 1890s or even up into the 20s and 30s, early 40s, um, most of them are still empty. And that was back when you subdivided, then you sold lots and people built houses. You didn't do the tract sort of thing that would come after the war. So it really comes to that point. And with all that development, we sort of realized we were up against it when it came to water. And that's when in 1944, 45, the federal government basically told San Diego, look, you're going to join the Metropolitan Water District because we've put in all this money and infrastructure down here. We got like 10 military bases, all this infrastructure. You've got to not run out of water here. So that's when we had to get the big pipes coming. And in 1948, the actual pipe into San Vicente was created and that we connected. And now we get something like 90 something percent of our water from somewhere else, right? So, but it also allowed the population to continue to expand. 
And so you're going to see that exponential growth, and La Mesa area is no different. In 1940, the population of the city of La Mesa was 4,000. By 1950, it's 10,000. By 1960, it's going to be almost 40,000. El Cajon is going to go through the same thing. It's going to go from like 1,500 to 4,000 to 4, 7,000, and it's going to be almost 50,000. Um, because there's a little more land out there to build, right? So you're going to see that. And this is that era to which you then begin this sort of now re-sort of focusing on, well, what's the post-war dream life, right? And so, of course, as we see up in the top, the two and a half kids there, uh, and, and that's actually a promo photo from the school district to try to entice teachers to come out because the Spring Valley District was going to build 17 schools within, they estimated, about 10 years after the war. The high school district expected to build at least six or seven, and they eventually would build 12 more um, high schools because suddenly people were moving out here to live that, that wonderful dream, but in a more mid-century style. So you begin to see the more modern styles. And that's certainly seen in the idea of the uh, outdoor swimming pool. And we had a big swimming pool company, um, if you know, the um, Catalina Pools was based here in La Mesa uh, and others. And so it also then becomes sort of a, a place where, where the cutting edge architecture can come. And so though we have great revival homes out in these areas as well, we also have some really great examples of modern architecture that was the cutting edge after the war. And if you were on our home tour a couple years ago or maybe this coming year, you get to see those from Lloyd Rocco. Uh, these are all Lloyd Rocco homes actually. Um, from the 40s and 50s, cutting edge architecture, a bastion to work. Professional clients were coming out, buying those two acre lots, wanting an architect, can afford an architect to design them something that is cutting edge, that looks to the future, that has that post-war sort of optimism that was flowing through the United States and certainly California after the war. Uh, we defeated the fascists. We were, you know, we, we could do anything, right? We could build bombs. We could do whatever we need. We're going, we're going to the moon soon, all those kinds of things. That's sort of the push. And you see that in our landscape here as well as the other things that come from suburbia, like, oh, shopping malls. Uh, Grossmont Center um, opened in 1961. It was the second to be announced. The first mall to be built was College Grove off the, 90, the new 94 freeway, right? Uh, it was the second announced, but the third to be actually opened. Mission Valley uh, opened before them, even though they were announced after. Uh, Welton Beckett, a well-known architect and planner, designed the Grossmont Center. Dell Webb was the contractor. His name sound familiar? And he owned the Yankees, also built a few places, uh, a few cities and stuff, right? So that's sort of the cutting edge of that there. Beckett would go on to do some pretty interesting things. Three years later, he would do the Ford building um, at the World's Fair, as well as the Disney building. And if you ever go to Disneyland and you're taking the train ride and, you know, you go through the primeval thing and all, that was all part of one of the exhibits that that uh, Be Beckett had done. And because of that success at the World's Fair, a couple things happened. One, he got the commission for a thing called Disney World in 1970, planned the whole thing. And also, a local architect by the name of Jim Hurley, uh, after, after um, Joe uh, Drew went out and saw the building in, at the World's Fair in 64, came back and said, hey, build me one that looks like that for my showroom. And that's where we got the Drew Roundhouse. It was a, it was a smaller scale version of the, the Ford Rotunda from the World's Fair. Unfortunately, it was torn down last year. Long story. We'll get into that if you come to our preservation <laughs> uh, discussion. Uh, but but was, that's where that came from. So, Welton Beckett. One of his first big projects, Grossmont Center Shopping Mall, um, the third here in the county. But you can also see the architecture and other things, such as if you happen to pick up my book on Grossmont Hospital, um, William Pereira designed the hospital right over here. Uh, that's, it's still underneath the seven <laughs> additions around it, but that's the original building. William Pereira went on to do some amazing things, including the Los Angeles Airport, if you know the theme building, the one that looks like the space pod with the, that's William Pereira. He designed all of the, he did the master plan for the city and the campus at Irvine, uh, did the same thing for, uh, I think it was um, Santa Cruz, he was involved in that one too. Um, the local guys doing work here, the guys from LA coming down doing work. So that's the Grossmont Hospital, but also local ar architects as well. Uh, the Santa Sofia Church, George Lycus a very modern interpretation of Spanish colonial for the Catholic Church that's still there and is an icon in Casa de Oro. Uh, or where that old country club was, uh, um, Colton Heaton, who built what is a very modern A-frame uh, th uh, there that's now the Trinity uh, Church right on the top of the hill there, a very icon for us as well. So with suburbia comes, of course, a lot of other institutions like schools. I mentioned Spring Valley, uh, Mesa Spring Valley ended up building about 15 to 17 elementary schools. El Cajon built another eight or 10, uh, just in sort of this area we're talking about. So when you think of Fuerte School, or there's Rancho under construction there out in the big Boldenbacher, Kelton um, subdivisions of Spring Valley Estates. Um, uh, on the left there, you can see 
the, the, the growth. This reminds me of the same, I grew up by the same time as San Jose in the late 60s, and you know the houses were being built as the schools were as well. And so they actually had to use the model house to sign up kids to go to Avondale, because Avondale wasn't quite ready in the spring <laughs> before it was going to open. So they were literally using the model house to sign kids up to go to school at Avondale. Um, and then, of course, our brand new Helix school. Of course, that's um, wonderful Murdoch named after the, um, the superintendent of the district who oversaw this massive expansion. Um, quite an quite amazing uh, opportunity and, and, and a job by everybody there. And of course, other institutions that were all notable to us um, are the high schools. There we go. Uh, Grossmont was the only high school uh, in this general area from 1920 till 1951. Uh, at that time, the district came out with a plan. They needed a high school in El Cajon, and they needed one in La Mesa. And they were going to be very unique in calling the one El Cajon and the other one La Mesa. Um, until, and, and the first one that was going to be done, finished first, was La Mesa. And at the meantime, the fact was that people was, it was going to draw people from the unincorporated Rolando. Rolando hadn't been incorporated into San Diego yet. So from Rolando, Lemon Grove, Spring Valley, we're all being told, you're going to end up going to the La Mesa school. And of course, they all said, well, we don't live in La Mesa. We don't want this thing called La Mesa. So there was sort of big uprising at the, at the uh, board meetings. What are we going to do? And it was, I am for, fortunately forgetting the name of the one, the one board member who said, well, gosh, what's, what's consistent? All of you people can see Helix from your neighborhoods, right? OK, it's not La Mesa High School. How about we call it Helix High School? And that's why La Mesa High School isn't La Mesa High School. It's Helix High School. Once again, Helix not in La Mesa. <laughs> But that's okay. So that's how Helix, and it's the first to open. Of course, there was delays. I did an article, if you're interested in hearing about the plane crash and other things that delayed construction at Helix. Um, oh, yeah, I haven't got so many intrigued there. Um, that they intrigued us at Helix. And, and so the first year was a split session on the Grossmont campus. And I love talking to folks who were there and saying, yep, so the sports teams at Helix practiced in the morning, went to school in the afternoon, and the Grossmont kids went to school in the morning and practiced in the afternoon. And that's how we survived that year, 51 52. First musket game was that year, et cetera. Um, so all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, but obviously, the, the great growth of the suburbs in Spring Valley, La Presa area, um, required another school. Uh, I know in 1955, El Cajon Valley, the new El Cajon Valley was created right down there off of First Street, um, was then Mount Miguel. Fun story of Mount Miguel. The district decided the name everybody was buying in. Okay, we can see Mount Miguel from here. If that's fine. Um, but they actually had decided that they were going to name uh, the team, that they, they were, were going to name the, nas the mascot for the high school. And so they said 49ers. And so in 1957, you got to remember, the only, the only professional football team in Southern California is the Rams. So when, when the, lake, the folks in Mount Miguel said, what do you mean? We're not going to become the 49ers. You can't do that. To the right. No way. And so they, they actually, this whole summer, a, uh, the student body that was going in there basically met, came back, and went to the, um, to the district and said, it's got to be something different. How about something kind of Spanish? How about mat matadors? And that's where matadors come from. So they were going to be the 49ers. So just so you know, that little surprise story. But they, they, they fought it, and they, they were able to fight, fight it off over time. Uh, obviously, then, this whole Sweetwater area became kind of, and so I actually, if you're in the book, it's great, because I have a picture. This is Monta Vista as it's brand new, and you can see the, all the hills, nothing behind them, right? Still all farms. I have another shot from 1967. It's all houses, all of it. Just huge suburban swath, people needing houses, putting the market out there. And of course, then finally, back to the sort of east end off of Hamishaw, um, Valhalla High School, which was designed by Ron Davis. Uh, he, there's only one other high school like that. That's Irvine High School in Orange County, the, the cylindrical high school. You see that in elementary schools. We had a few of those in San Jose when I grew up. But only known two high schools I know that have that whole round sign, and which some people love and some people hate. I'll let the Norsemen decide their fate on that one. So, All right. We're closing up here pretty soon. Come on. Man, it's going slow today. Ah, here we go. Now, a few other things you probably didn't know about that whole area out there. Uh, the La Mesa Airport, which, of course, was at the corner of, of Sweetwater and Hamishaw, nowhere near La Mesa. It lasted about four years until Fred Hansen, who actually owned a lot of that area uh, at the time, was looking to sort of develop it as well, realized that there really wasn't going to be any money. I mean, what you see is a huge proliferation right after the war with all these folks learning to fly in the military and everything of the assumption that, you know, and you see this actually in the design of, Avoca of, of Alvarado Estates next to San Diego State. If you know anything about that area, there's an Avion Drive. That was going to be the runway and the landing strip, right? Because professionals weren't going to just have cars, right? They were going to have airplanes, <laughs> right? And so this whole assumption that you know, the ultimate suburbia would be you need a, a strip so that you could fly in for your house and your business or whatever. And so this was, and so you see a lot of little 
airports popping up. But within a few years, the FAA, the FAA was realized, wait a minute, this is getting a little crazy. You think people are crashing the cars enough, well, this, is, this is an issue. And so it didn't really work, it was too far out. And Hansen realized as the speculators started rolling into him saying, sure we can't build houses there instead? I think we can make some more money building houses than having a, an airport. And so it only lasted about five or six years and then went away. Um, by the meantime, that, old, that whole unincorporated area between El Cajon and La Mesa is, is needing, as it's growing, it needs infrastructure. And the problem with, with either city coming into this area is that if you are incorporated into a city, you need to have a sewer system. All right, now think about the engineering with all that rock and everything in the Helix area. The system would be, I mean, it'd be lift stations every five feet. I mean, it would be, it's an engineering nightmare to try to put a sewer system into Mount Helix. So those areas, there were several attempts to incorporate both ways, from El Cajon and from La Mesa, and it just came up to it wasn't cost effective to do it that way. Um, and that's why the area pretty much never incorporated. So in the meantime, they're saying, well, who's covering us? CDF is moving out to Hamashaw, they used to be in La Mesa. But, so that was the creation of some of the smaller districts in there, Grossmont, Mount Helix, the little San Miguel, that have now, of course, merged up together. But that, that was the original. So in late, I think it was in 5960, they built the fire station down there at the base of Mount Helix. Uh, a couple other things. Uh, in 1970, out came a plan from a very large corporation from back east that they were going to create the new city of Rancho San Diego. And they were basing this on Caltrans plans to extend the 94 all the way down what's now Hamishaw, turn up and connect it and blow right through 2nd Street to connect to 8. That was going to be a whole freeway, all of it, freeway. And they assumed they could put 20,000 houses, enough people for 20,000 houses, they'd incorporated its own city to deal with all those issues of infrastructure uh, that the county couldn't handle. At the same time, 1970 was also the passage of the California Environmental Quality Act. And so they were one of the first to get to do an environmental impact report. And because most of the area had been left as ranch land, it also had large numbers of endangered species, had some really great archeological sites and other things that sort of delayed their progress. And when they finally got around to development in the early 90s, um, several companies later, the project was of course much smaller. And today you know there's still development around there and it's, but there's also some open space that was required to be based on these new laws and the ways we look at planning. And one of the institutions that actually was the first to go in was the second campus of the community college district. So we had Grossmont open up up here on, in El Cajon that served this area, and their second campus, Cuyamaca, which opened in 1977. And there is that right there on Fury Drive. You can still see the sign. It's got a few more veg vegetation around it now, but that's sort of. So some of the institution stuff that you see in that sort of east end there, taking the old mono. Sorry, this might. Sorry, I'm doing my Beto thing here. Um, so um, you're getting you're getting all that. Um, infrastructure being put in, maybe not at the initial development scale that we thought, but certainly now it's all developed and you know you've got shopping malls and churches and all kinds of good stuff over there. So the way I wrap up the book was then for the sort of the purpose as to why I was asked to write it originally. So we talked about, you know, the wonderful Easter services and the park and the theater and what had happened was basically the family um, had the white family donated, the Yankee family donated the land to the county with the guys that it would always have to be used for the Easter services, um, and that it would be a public park otherwise. Um, and so the county basically ran it as a public park until the late 80s when American Civil Liberties Union and others were starting to question the fact that there was this cross at the top on the public, pro the public property. So as you know, this is a problem at Mount Soledad and other places where these issues of, of sort of crossed of church and state. And so there was a big movement to try to figure out what to do. And as you can see from a certain person who is still uh, currently our county supervisor, Diane Jacob, who went to Rolando Elementary, by the way, um, uh, that there was a big movement to how, to how can we save this landmark, you know, separate of the issues, right? And of course, the groups like the Mesa Rotary had run the event for many decades and a lot of concerns. And in, in the, during this threat, a young high school uh, fellow there, uh, Sean Carroll, met up with Ed Fletcher Jr., who actually oversaw the construction in 1925 for his father, uh, Ed Fletcher Sr., uh, and met and got it determined that it was a historical landmark to the state of California and that we needed to protect it, et cetera. So what they needed was some kind of compromise. How can we figure out a way to make this work? This is this icon. And so uh, originally, it was an attempt to sell the, the cross property to the San Diego Historical Society. So, well, it's a historic mine. We'll sell to this private nonprofit, and that wasn't going to go. And there were some issues there with the historic society wasn't really up for it and didn't have the infrastructure. So then someone came with the idea, well, what if we create a new nonprofit organization that's sole purpose is to run this park 
but privately own it, but run it as a public park. And that was, in fact, the solution that turned into the creation of the Mount Helix Park Foundation. And so the, the litigants agreed that this was, because they, actually the litigants won the first case, which is why the cro Mount Helix is still on the city's um, uh, logo, but it, not the cross. So the mountain's still there, but not the cross. That was the settlement for the city of La Mesa. Um, here, they were trying to figure out, and so basically, the county was able to deed the property to a nonprofit that could fulfill all of the original grant agreements and all the deed agreements from this, the family to keep it as a public park, but it'd be privately owned. Therefore, that was an agreement that they settled on. And so that cutting edge, and I mean, I work for state parks. We have all kinds of, I work a lot of partnerships. We have nonprofits run some parks for us, then it makes sense in some places, and some it's okay. Um, this has actually worked out probably as a model for how to deal with this particular issue to still allow the public use of this property as to the original deed agreement, but not get in the card of this, of this, in this case, the county owning a property with this religious symbol on it. So that's really been for, they're they able to then for take on, you know, as a nonprofit, they can take donations, you get your tax write-off, all those good things. And of course, they do an amazing job at managing the park. Um, and they still do lots of events there. Um, and whether it's caroling or theater events or their big fundraiser in August, which you should always go to, it's a lot of fun, uh, the art, the heart of uh, Mount Helix. And really, we're able to come up with this cutting edge thing. So now we still have a public park with private ownership and private management that works out for everybody's benefit. So, ta-da. And this is a great shot I got <laughs> from, from John Adams, um, who, uh, who is a, 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 kid, a guy who grew up here, became an architect, really nice guy. And uh, in fact, I think their family home was just uh, made in Landmark. Um, and this is supposedly his grandmother has this shot of them driving. They, these ladies, these are some looking tough ladies. 1920, they drove up to the top. And I'm sure, 1920, because Prohibition, I'm sure it's just soda. Um, <laughs> Uh, as an archaeologist, I can tell you, we knew there was still liquor around. Anyway, we that. Um, but anyway, celebrating at the top of the undeveloped hill there. So cheers to Mount Helix and to all those in the area. All right, so that's it. So I, I, can, I can answer any questions. Also, I do have a whole thing on, on the Easter services if you're really bored, but I assume you probably want to leave. Uh, it's only 20 slides. It's not that bad. But. You, want to, you guys want to, you want to go for it? Since it's that time of year? All right, let's see what we can do here. Come on. Uh oh So in 1912, this is what it looked like from Mount Nebo, looking out over the little brand new city of La Mesa. All right? So that's up on the top there, probably Summit Drive, looking down. Main drag. Lemon sort of going this way through the middle. The next one up would be in La Mesa, well, that time, Lookout Avenue. Very pro progressive community. Um, that's the original bank building. was designed actually by... Um, Irving Gill it was right there on the corner. Oh, yep. Uh, that's a whole other lecture. I got it on there. But I, I, I'll get, yes. Were they connected with that original? With the Lookout Park subdivision in 1907 and then the Windsor Hills in 1927. So if you're in downtown La Mesa and, you, and you're driving north on Spring Street and you look to the left and you see the hill there, just above like Acacia, and so it goes, it goes Spring Street, Nebo, Date, Acacia, then you start going up the hill, Fairview, Pasadena, that's Mount Nebo. Subtly named by developer Sherman Grable because of course, Mount Nebo is where, where Moses saw the promised land. Subtle, isn't it? A little subtle commerce, right? So there you go. Anyway, so you know, the, the idea of progressive things are, you know, they're thinking far, far ahead, et cetera. Irving Gill, the famed architect, did two buildings in La Mesa. This one, which of course is torn down, this is where the um, Goodwill store is there at the corner of, of La Mesa Springs now. So it was originally the, both the Bank of La Mesa, which he was partners in, and the real estate office, which he owned. <laughs> we can give you the loan and the right, right? Good thinking. <laughs> Gotta make that. And that was cleanup day in 1912, and everybody came out with their brooms to help clean up city. So, anyway. He also did the, the La Mesa Heights School in 1911, which is a little version of what's the Bishop School. Unfortunately, it was torn down in 1932 uh, for the John Muir School, which is over now in the college area. So anyway, you get it, the Women's Club, uh, which we are hoping to actually, we're in the process of getting all of their records transferred to us. It's gonna be an amazing collection. Uh, you know, we had baseball teams, we had schools. There's your Allison School with the, with the addition on it before the grammar school would be built by Richard Wecko, by the way, in a mission revival style in 1914. Uh, and of course, spiritual growth. So that original La Mesa Methodist Church ends up moving into 
into La Mesa from from town site into Allison Springs, La Mesa. Uh, and um, and there they were originally at the corner of Lemon and Palm and then moved across the street. So where the little bank building that's the spa now, across the street, that's the new church. The original 197 church was on that the other corner. Uh, you have the Congregational Church. Emmerbrook Weaver designed that very modern building in 1911. That was a very cutting-edge style. It's now the rectory on 3rd there. The 20s Spanish colonial, colonial church is right up facing Lemon. But you're going to have the Baptist church. So you, you, there was four or five for, for a community of about 1,000 people, four or five churches as we're talking about by this point. And then you begin to see, of course, people building houses, right? And there's the Grable House at the top end of Date where it curls around up at the top. It's all surrounded by stuff now. Um, and they are building the, the stone walls along, uh, I think that's now Pasadena, coming up the hill there, and date running up that way. So Lookout Park, so that's where they first, so the, recognizing this was sort of a cutting edge thing in suburban design was this idea of having walkways between steep streets. And if you ever go to Rolando, there's street, there's ramps and staircases that allow you to get up and down those canyons in the set up in the 20s. It was considered sort of elite, sort of so people could neighborly, could get around and move through. And if you lived up on those steep streets, you didn't want to walk all the way to the end to walk all the way down. They wanted these cut throughs. And so they literally put them in and deeded them to the city. And then that was followed when Windsor Hills comes in the 20s and they built them all the way to the top. So this gives you an idea of what's going on here. So um, in the meantime, some of the, the more prominent folks in La Mesa um, began to build really nice houses on Mount Nebo. And they form their own little club, and we get to, we learn about this from little articles in the new, local newspaper about what the Mount Nebo Club was doing, and they called themselves that, and some pretty significant folks. And you can see houses are being attached to the hillside there. And today you can still see some of those houses that, of these prominent families, the Todd House, uh, the Hodgson House, and the Worth House, all within about a block of each other there up Pasadena and Vista. And you begin to see them sort of having parties and soirees and things and looking at things to sort of grow community in the area. And like I said, uh, there's sort of some rough references to sort of just some people deciding to walk up in 1913 on their own, sort of like, hey, we're going to go do this kind of thing and go watch the sunrise from Prospect Park. So if you know, that was the end of, that was sort of the only piece of, of um, the Lookout Park subdivision. It got up to that little circular street. It's all filled with houses. It's Prospect Park. And then the rest all the way up to the summit that wasn't developed until the 20s. So that was sort of the, the beginning of it. And so we know that for sure there was an official event where that was promoted in 1914 by the churches to have everybody literally start at about 5 in the morning and walk all the way up to Prospect Park so that they could see the sunrise come up, right? And, and then there was a reverend there to give some services for them. So that was that. And, and you know, it became formalized. And, and this is from, I think, the 1915 event right there at Mount Nebo. And so Easter Sunrise Pilgrim is to Mount Nebo. So that's sort of where it got started. So it really started in La Mesa. And here's, you know, Howard, there's Mr. Worth himself. D.C. Collier, you know, Collier Park was one of the developers who sold all the land to Grable and Park. Um, there were choirs and there were songs and they would haul a piano up there and all kinds of other things um, to really make it a big deal and try to promote people to want to come live in La Mesa. See, it's a, it's a wonderful progressive, you know, Moral city. We got churches. We got everything. You need schools. We got everything. Come on, bring bring your family out here to La Mesa. And that's a picture of Prospect Park in the 1915 or 16, 16 services. And obviously, no houses around there yet. It's all surrounded by houses now, and not too big. And already by 1916, there was a lot of concern that there wasn't enough room. In fact, they basically told everybody you got to hike up. And there were some people who were saying, "Hike all the way up there. I can't do it. Um, can't we drive people up there?" And so they were having some logistics issues. Uh, and then in 1917, when the war And the Congress said, that's it, We're, we've got to get into this. You know, it's affecting us too directly. We have to stop this. So that's when we, we joined in World War I. And so that comes up. And so basically in 17, they decide not to do anything. In the meantime, there was a group from San Diego called the San Diego Advertisers Club. And they had decided that they were looking for places to go do events and promote. And so they decided, they talked to, they knew Ed Fletcher. They said, hey, look, we're going to drive up Easter morning to the top of Mount Helix. And they held sort of an informal, just for their club members, 
uh, event on the top of undeveloped Mount Helix in 1917. And so that's where we say 1917 is the first year of Mount Helix having Easter sunrise service. There was no competition from La Mesa because they had canceled it due to the war. And so it sort of sort of went through. And the Masons, it appears, didn't really know much about it since it was a fairly tight event that was going on at Mount Helix. Um, and of course, interesting enough, we begin to see early on some of these um, Mary Yaki White, that's the daughter of, I mean, the wife of Fred, uh, the daughter of, of the Mary Yaki's that are going to come up with the money, and the brother Cyril, who's the, the very wealthy um, uh, lumberman. So they're living out here, and they're talking about wanting to go up there and how great it was to go up there, because they, they knew about the Advertising Club project, and they went up there that day and talked about how great it was. So that whole thing sort of comes together, and there's all this, and, and lots of interesting people, you know, what's going on? So, and there's people who remember it in, in different occasions. And the, and the best thing to remember about the San Diego Advertising um, Club is that they're the advertising club. So this also begins this wonderful that 8,000 people attend services. Okay, just so you know, the current theater holds 1,200. Okay? So there, maybe there might be a little bit of PR hyperbole here, just maybe a little, right? So just know that, and they're going to continue to run this event, and we get these numbers constantly every year after. Um, so anyway, so like I said, 1917, not much going on up there. There's a, there's a little road that you could barely get your, your model uh, A up there, or whatever, C, uh, to get there. So finally in 1918, the question, so what's going on? La Mesa church leaders are ready to redo their event on Mount Nebo. Um, the Ad Club suddenly puts out these big advertisements much bigger than what has been going on in La Mesa, saying, hey, we're, we're going to have a real big shindig this year on Mount Helix. Get, come on up there. And this causes some grief locally. But the final solution was that the, the La Mesa folks realized, well, why don't we just, you know, we were having some logistic issues. These guys have real advertising budgets. <laughs> we still get promoted by having this event on Mount Helix. Um, and so they basically agreed to say, yeah, you guys take care of it, and we can, we'll, sh we'll see you there bright and early. We don't have to do anything. It's cool. <laughs> So the subtlety on that. But there were a couple editorials where they were pretty ticked, actually. Uh, I'll just let you know. How dare you step on our toes? Easter service draw sign. And then, of course, Ed Fletcher's little Grossman Inn, which has been converted to a house since there um, over the years, um, was sort of the one place you could go. And, you, and then they got absolutely overwhelmed and ran out of food or something. It was a little story um, to keep up with everything. And there were singers and summits and all kinds of fun things going on. And that's the original cross that was there. It's a little less uh, robust as the one that um, Richard Requa designed in 1925. It gives you an idea. And that's what it looked like before the theater. Once again, you have the pastor on his little thing and people are just sort of, they cleared the brush and you're just sitting up there and good thing it's early, the snakes aren't around <laughs> in this time of year. Um, and so they were all prepped and they just kind of hung out and climbed on the rock. This is where Mrs. Yaki, the older Mrs. Yaki, came and said, very nice, but it would be a, maybe a little more comfortable, perhaps, would make it a little bit nicer, right? So that's where that comes from. Anyway. And of course, uh, Requa designing it and the Yaki's who funded it, and of course, the rest, as you know, is pretty much history, and it continued on and on. The uh, Mesa Rotary running the, the event for many decades. And it, I think it rotates around and you know that one, and then you know that one. Ta -da. So there's a little more on that story. Hey. Any questions or I wore you out? I wore you out? Okay. Hey, thanks for coming. Uh, keep an eye out on for events. Let us know about the newsletter. And uh, if you haven't joined, join up and find out what's going on. We're always looking for volunteers uh, at the house. The house is open every Saturday. We're always looking for docents, as well as folks in the archives and everything else. Thanks.